Welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Phil Arno. You know, about 155 years ago, I was born in Children's Hospital right here in Buffalo. It, well, might not quite have been that long. I lose track of time. But Children's Hospital, Oshai Children's Hospital, Buffalo General, DeGraff, Millard Fillmore, they're run by Kaleida Health. And the coronavirus situation hasn't closed them down. In fact, they're more important now than ever before. Part of the reason why they can continue to serve Western New York is because of the Kaleida Health Foundation. It provides funds that are, make a part of their budget for capital improvements and now for a little bit of a different contribution to the operation. So right now I want to welcome my guest for today's big picture, Carol Horton, who's president of the Kaleida Health Foundation. Uh, welcome to the show, Carol. How are you doing today? Hi, I am hanging in there as well as anybody can in these circumstances. Well, it's un uncharted territory, and so we have to really kind of make it up as we go, I guess. Um, and that's especially true with the, uh, the, the Kaleida Health Foundation, which you are involved with. Uh, it, it's, it's normally, it goes along and it helps to raise funds for the operation of the hospitals. Um, tell me a little bit about the circumstances now and what you're going through in the foundation and how everything is kind of maneuvering in, in, in this situation. Right. So normally the Kaleida Health Foundation supports um, Buffalo General Hospital, um, Gates Vascular Institute, Millard Fillmore Suburban, DeGraff, um, High Point on Michigan, the Visiting Nurse Association, and our Flint Road Labs. So obviously that's a long list of, um, of entities to support. And we support them operationally with capital projects. For instance, in Buffalo General, we helped redo the lobby over the past couple of years. At Miller Fillmore Suburban, we helped support some of the robots for the robotic minimally invasive surgery. So we do projects like that all the time and even nursing education and even things to help um, patients be more comfortable, you know, with gift certificates and things like that. I mean, a wide, wide gamut of things. And so we're still trying to do all those things, but the way we raise money is obviously very different. In the past, we're very dependent on live events, as I'm sure you've been to many of our events. And now we're really having to change that up and start getting involved with some virtual events, which is a lot of fun, but it's very different when you don't have that face-to-face that -face connection with folks. So we've had a nice start and, and once again, the um, generosity of Western New Yorkers is always remarkable. And to date, I'm pleased to say we've raised almost a half million dollars in cash specifically for our COVID response fund, which is a specific fund that we started early in March when we started realizing that this thing is bigger than all of us. And, and that fund is going now, not so much for the capital projects, but to help mm -hmm. the, the, the healthcare workers, I understand, to deal with with the circumstances because they're facing a, a very different challenge, correct? Exactly, so that's a big part of this. So now we've pivoted from kind of some of those huge projects like lobbies and robots and equipment to really now raising money that strictly focuses on our frontline workers and how we respond to the COVID pandemic. So it can be things as simple as meals for our frontline workers. We have actually served over 40,000 meals to our frontline workers here in the past almost two months now. So that's just one thing we can do when people are just so tired and you know emotionally, physically, um, most of our personnel now are working double shifts. So you can only imagine how grueling that is under normal circumstances, let alone when we're dealing with something that is just so tenuous and people don't really uh, yet know what all of the outcomes are going to be to this. So that's one thing we've been able to do that's been nice. And also what's been nice about that kind of an aside is that that has helped support some of our local restaurants too, because as we know, it's um, that's been very tough economically for some of the businesses that have had to shut down. So it's nice that we're able to um, purchase meals from the restaurants through the foundation, through the COVID response fund, and then feed the frontline workers. 
but the uh, fund has also been supporting things like the PPE, the new you know acronym of the day that everyone is learning all about the masks and the gowns and things like that. Um, we've also been able to support some frontline workers by putting them up in hotel rooms. So this is um, something that you can imagine if you're concerned that you've been exposed to the virus and perhaps you live at home with you know an elderly person, a high risk patient, you don't want to potentially expose them. So we've been able to put some folks up in hotel rooms who are nervous about going home. So that's another way we've been able to, uh, to help out. Yeah, this is, it's, a, it's a challenging profession anyway. You know, healthcare workers, doctors, nurses. Um, but under these circumstances, it's, it's really diff different and, and it's challenging in, in a much more complicated way. Um, you know, recently it was nurse, Nurses Week and I'm sure nurses are dealing with it in, in a way that, that, you know, they haven't had to deal with it before. Like you say, you know, their personal lives are now affected because if they do live in a household with, with anybody who is vulnerable, that's got to come into play. And you guys are, are helping out with that. Mm -hmm. That's what we're able to do by those, those optional hotel rooms, which is really nice. And I think more than anything, Obviously, we have to be wary of the virus, but I think psychologically to know that you're not going to be putting your loved ones at risk is also a tremendous help. And that's um, something that we're seeing, too, that's going to be ongoing and that we hope to be able to use this fund for is just um, behavioral health or if folks are really feeling like they're struggling, you know, we have resources in place and um, folks that employees can talk to to kind of help manage their stress because this is really crazy stuff, as we all know. Now explain to me how that works. The fund, I mean, the, the foundation raises funds and you coordinate with the actual uh, operations of, of the, the hospitals. And, and the, the administrators of the hospitals, you, they have a budget or how, how do you interact? Who decides uh, what funds go where and how much is used for the the new fund which is the you know helping of the workers and the operational funds which was traditionally what you did the inner workings of that it, it, you you had to really change on the fly with all this didn't you we did that is a, that's the optimum phrase it's a very very fluid situation so we're still working through it um you know the immediate need has been things like the the meals for the frontline workers the hotel rooms the PPE, and then any supplies that frontline workers might need to help keep patients safe. That's been tantamount for sure. But as we go on, what we'll do is we'll work with our hospital executives to find out what the real immediate needs are and things that we didn't normally have funding for and very important things that normally insurance may not pay for. And then that way the fund can help support those things. Hmm. And has the uh... The capital expenditures, the operational, um, has that kind of been on, been put on hold for now and you're, you're concentrating on helping out the workers or are you working along parallel lines? I'm not quite sure whether you can do any, any uh, capital improvements while this coronavirus thing is going on. Right, right now really the focus is on the frontline workers and what they need to help get our patients well. Um, one thing that is of a capital nature that has really um, gotten kind of hot right now is telemedicine. And telemedicine has been something that Kaleida and most health organizations has been looking at for many years now. But it's really come to the forefront with this uh, pandemic. And, you know, traditionally, the um, impetus for telemedicine being needed and popular is that it's all about access. So many people in our country don't live in a city where they can just drive down the block and get to their local healthcare facility. Such a great portion of our country and Western New York is very, very, very rural. So telemedicine is something that we've been looking at and wanting to increase our presence with, particularly with the Visiting Nurse Association. The Visiting Nurse Association uh, covers all eight counties of Western New York. So it's a program that we've been kind of, you know, dipping our, our toes into over the past couple of years. But now what we've realized with this virus is that it's not just about accessibility, it's also about safety. So when you're dealing with something that's so highly contagious, it's obviously a benefit to be able to use telemedicine so that you can both be protected, both the healthcare provider can be protected and the patient can be protected from spreading any kind of germs. 
Hmm. And, you know, we don't know how this thing is going to play out. You know, obviously, like we said earlier, we're kind of making it up as we go. But you can't do that, really, when you're involved in the type of situation that you have to handle. It's a fund, and, and you have to raise funds, you have to distribute funds. So there's a certain amount of planning that really has to happen. So you, you don't have a, you know, a, a crystal ball. You're in this just like we all are. You don't know where it's going. How do you plan the future when it comes to this foundation without knowing where this is going? I mean, it's got to be a tremendous burden figuring out where, where we go from here. It, it, it is, and it's really just one week at a time. And again, it's, it's kind of pivoting and shifting and changing all the time. But there's one thing that is very certain, and that is that we are going to need millions, tens of millions of dollars. I mean, one of the things, aside from what we're dealing with on a regular basis, and of course, the I'm sure you've read in the news about, it's not just the expense of treating the pandemic itself, but it's also the lost revenue because of um, having to put the, the kibosh, if you will, on the elective surgery. So it's a twofold thing. You, you know, you've got the cost of trying to treat the virus and then you're losing all of this revenue from not having your elective surgeries. Hopefully that's going to remedy itself very, very soon and already has to a certain degree in some of our facilities. Um, but just then the cost of opening back up because we're going to have all new protocols in place. So all new protocols in place for just cleaning alone, for testing, um, for instance, at the Children's Hospital now, um, when a woman goes in to have her baby, she's going to be tested for COVID. There's a cost to that. So I just saw something come across my desk the other day from the Visiting Nurse Association, whereby they're going to be um, incurring another $3 million a year just with new procedures that make everyone safe. So this is not going to be over when we open up. This is going to be a whole new way of life for all of us for, I would imagine, I'm not a clinician, but I would imagine for a very, very long time. Now, in your position, you, you really have to wear two hats. You have to understand the foundation side of it. And because of, of the connection, you have to understand the, the clinical side or the, the medical side. But you know your expertise can only go so far. How do you <laughs> coordinate with the clinical side, which is not your expertise, and you, you haven't come from that side, you have to coordinate with the administrators from the hospitals to kind of do that planning, and do they guide you as to where their needs are going to be and the people that, that are working there? I, give us a little insight as to how your decision-making process has to unfold. Right, very much so. So I work very closely with the um, hospital administrators and our entire executive team. So in particular, I work with Chris Lane, who's the president of Buffalo Medical General Center and Gates Vascular Institute, and Darcy Craven, who's the president of Millard Fillmore and DeGraff. And of course, um, Jody LaMeo, our, our CEO and president, and Dr. Dave Hughes, our chief medical officer, and all of the, then the um, chief medical officers at the individual sites as well. So, you know, what they'll do is they'll basically call me up and say, Carol, oh my gosh, there's, you know, a need for this, that, or the other. Do we have the funds? And then as a group, we kind of decide where the priorities lie. And because obviously I'm not a clinician, I need to rely on their expertise as well. And then we decide together, um, which is the best fund to draw the monies from, um, or if it's something that can wait, or maybe it's something that we apply um, for, for a grant. Um, you know, kind of what's the best approach to get the, the monies that they need at the time. Let's, we're going to have more of a discussion in just a minute about the Clyde Health Foundation and the circumstances surrounding our current lockdown. Stay tuned and we'll be right back with Carol Horton right after this.